Welcome, Pudding People, to another episode of Everybody Loves Pudding. I am your host, Ken Seymour. Today, I have a fantastic guest for you. He is an actor, but more importantly, he is a man that knows Christmas like no other. We have the amazing Jonathan Stoddard. Oh, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Appreciate it so much. Well, I, I am just ecstatic for you to join us because uh, anyone that knows me that just immediately goes, you know, you, when we talk to you, we think Christmas just because you look like Santa Claus, maybe, you know, <laughs> sons a few pounds, but. Uh... <laughs> well, that's what pillows are for the giant red suit so you can stuff it, cotton balls, everything. Exactly. You just get into the whole spirit of things. Uh, and. <laughs> Spirit's kind of important uh, to me. I love the spirit of just the whole industry and uh, creating these fictions that we all get to enjoy. So I often like to ask the most basic, most simple of questions to start things off. How did you get into the industry? Where where was your passion ignited to do what you do? I mean, honestly, it's a long story, so I don't know how long we have. And the short version is even longer. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I will say, I will say, you know, there's several times I think that we all go through as adults in which we reevaluate, you know, what, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? All that kind of stuff. And um, through any kind of research of me, you'll find that I've had several different lives and meaning I've really devoted myself to several different professions or skill sets or things like that. So I've tried, I've tried doing other things. I have tried to get away from the screen. I've tried to get away from acting. And part of the, the reason why I got into it was because there's nothing, nothing else like this. And there's nothing that fulfills me and kind of pushes my buttons, stretches me as a human being, forces me to get out of my comfort zone, continue learning and developing not only as myself, but also the community at large nothing has this kind of ceiling like nothing else has this kind of a ceiling in terms of possible influence for storytelling and reach and being able to do good and not that all movies are going to be you know phenomenal philanthropic incredible movies but with that platform and with that reach you know it's the movie stars that end up making some of the biggest uh community social impacts um it's it's really, it's really a huge responsibility. And from an early age, I just, my parents, I remember telling me that I kept saying this one idea or this one phrase that I want to make the world a better place. And I'm either going to change it from the inside out or knock on the door hard enough to change it from the outside in. And to me, acting is one of those really interesting ways of doing both. So I'm not going to be a politician, but, you know, <laughs> going into acting is, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it has that kind of responsibility, but just with a little kind of rock and roll flair. Well, definitely. I would, as a consumer of, some would say too much pop culture, uh, I, I am, I am all, all too familiar with the impact that uh, the first point of contact will give us, whether that's through music or whether it's through film uh, so any television show any any movie we see we see certain faces over and over and over and whether we are intended uh, to do so or not we tend to become trusting of of these individuals and and you have just a fantastic platform to be able to if nothing else uh, spread some ideas ask some questions maybe that didn't get to be asked do you have any instances up until this point specifically in this vein of thought where you've been able to bring a subject to attention that you haven't seen uh, seen addressed in the way that you'd hoped or anything uh, that's really surprised you know, surprised you the effect that you've been able to have? I will say uh, most of my film film career has ha happened within the last like three or four years. Uh, the occasional one-offs, um, like in some of the indie projects and really getting started before quarantine and uh, even with a lot of the commercials and little stints with Young and the Restless and stuff like that. I'll say that uh, this is a roundabout way of answering your question. I haven't dove in the way that I really want to. And in terms of 
charities and backing really passionate topics and and social change and things that I do want to do, I've barely, barely scratched the surface. And it's actually one of the things that I want to do this year because, I mean, I've, I've done something like 30 something movies in the last, like since quarantine. And I've, I've just been very busy. I've been very, very busy. And I'm starting to get to a point where now that I don't have to convince anybody that I'm an actor, which is, you know, the, that's the first half of this journey for us creatives yeah. is convincing somebody that you're supposed to be there. And I don't have that itch anymore. And now I really want to focus on this year about my social reach as opposed to just, hey, please let me do this. I can do this. Please, please, please. Like, look, I've, I've done a lead. I've, I've taken the classes. I, I understand a little bit about like movement and how to hit my mark and how to say a line. Um, so yeah. this year is really, you know, you're hitting it on the nose. This year is really about what what that reach is going to look like for me. So I still need to define that. And, um, and I'm going to be participating pretty heavily in some social change issues, but I, I do need to dial that in. Well, luckily, so long as we all have breath, we still have time to affect change for the Absolutely. positive. Now I, I, for sure, when I was looking at your history and everything that you've done, when I asked the question, like what, what was the point at which I knew this was going to be the thing I thought for sure you were going to bring up your uh, role in cabaret, just because that's just the most fun role of all time to be able to do. And and that's such, uh, if if any of you listeners have never seen that particular play, mwah, it's, it's so much fun. Yeah, wow. I You are one of the, the only people who have ever brought that up. That was, that is like the perfect role for me. There are a lot of like alpha males and then there are a lot of effeminate males and something about the MC in Cabaret <laughs> is such a beautiful, right? One foot in uh, one side and one foot in the other. And it's, it's, he's masculine, but in a fun, you know, <laughs> in a fun feminine kind of way. And, um, or maybe it's the other way around, mostly feminine with, with a fun masculine edge. But either way, the, that that embodies me in a way that I cannot explain in words. I absolutely loved it. And I've done, you know, plays or musicals like Grease and Tony and West Side Story and stuff like that. And there's just something so, so special about Cabaret. But I mean, I had the itch before then, but that's definitely, I think, something that greatly and heavily influenced my decisions later. Because I, so I will say this, the moment, the moment that I knew um, so I went to school for physics, college for physics, and then I dropped out and I went to culinary school and I was, I found my way cooking in Italy and I was in Venice um, and uh, the period of time in which I was granted was expiring and the owner of the restaurant in Venice, Italy was like, he came up to me and he said, I want you to stay here five years or move over to the West Coast with us and start working with our chefs over there. And I said, uh, let me think about it. And I started asking myself, I was in my early 20s, this is a major question, right? I, and this isn't just about like, you know, when you're young, everyone says you can, oh, don't worry about it. You're young. You like, you can have time to make mistakes, right? It's so, but I'm sitting there going five years. This isn't just my life. This is someone else's life. I mean, I don't mind learning. I love the kitchen so much, food, everything, but I need to be considerate of other people's time with the decisions that I'm making. So what would I do? Age old question. If you had millions in the bank, what would you do for free? And my only answer, my only answer at the time, and it was probably influenced by West Side Story, Cabaret, and all of these other on stage uh, productions that we did, but it was, it was act. I wanted to act. And that's when I had that first round of thinking like, well, if I wanted to act, why don't I just do community theater? Why on screen? Why? um why not musicals or why not yeah local or go to broadway right there are a lot of different ways that you can be an actor and um and it's because of the things i mentioned earlier from reach to movie star which you know is an interesting idea within itself but there's a there's a lot of interesting stuff that brought me here but that is kind of that was that was the the moment and i moved to la slept on a couch 
of a friend of mine's place and I started doing extra work and I did that for like a year and a half, two years. And then I left LA. <laughs> that's understandable. So, I mean, that's, yeah. And I got back in a, re- I mean, the rest of that story is just, I, I got back into restaurants in Northern California cause um, that's just what I knew how to do. Yeah. And then I got scouted by someone up there and they said, you should try acting. And I was like, mm. <laughs> and then um, I don't know, they kind of stoked that fire and I'm forever grateful for that woman that did. And um, I still, I still go to her and uh, she's still this mentor of mine and she's amazing. Um, and then started booking up there and then everyone was like, you need to go to LA. And I was like, all right, round two, let's do this. <laughs> no, try try my... try again right that's the the definition of insanity right but sometimes exactly. it works exactly exactly so uh, it's been a journey for sure it's been a journey yeah it, 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 the, that that plays stuck with me for years that the fact that the mc gets to have such a chance to ooze charisma break that fourth wall interact with the uh, audience in a way that a lot of other plays don't allow for and get that immediate that visceral reaction uh, I, I love watching that little back and forth between the person performing and the people that are watching. So people laugh at me. It's like, I'm not looking at the stage. I'm looking at how people are reacting to the, to the MC. It's like, it's, it's like Rocky horror, not quite to that level, but you know, that, that kind of a, a vibe. No, oh, it's infectious. Uh, I mean, you can, from that opening number where it's like, welcome and bienvenue, welcome. <laughs> like you can't, the the joy i mean it, it's just so fun and the top hats and everything it sucks you in everyone loves a period piece so it doesn't matter who you are everyone loves it and it, it it's just a world it's a it's its own world and it's incredible talking about its own world you mentioned this earlier and i this is something that i wanted to touch on i've, I've had the, the the good fortune to speak to a handful of people that have been in this very specific subsection of the the industry that is the same, but at the same time, so different than everything else. You talked about your run on Young and the Restless and that whole daytime drama thing is so different in terms of production and the way that it's expected. Was it, was it something that you were prepared for when you started doing that? No, (laughs) no, nothing. Everything in this industry for me has punched me so hard in the face. Wonderfully. Don't get me wrong, wonderfully, or maybe in the stomach. It takes the wind out of me every time. I still remember that that was not, uh, so Young and the Restless was not originally a recurring role, the, the role that I got. It was an under five. And even the under five, so I only thought I was gonna go on set once for one day, and I couldn't eat for two days beforehand. Like I was, I was, I was, just nauseous feeling everywhere throughout my body. And, and I don't know how to describe it, but I I remember those moments leading up to my first day on set and that morning, um, so viscery, so viscerally. And like, I remember the first, my first lead, um, in like a real movie that wasn't done by a friend of mine and (laughs) crying on the street. Like when my, cause my agent came to my house, knocked in the door and was like, let's go on a walk. And then as we're walking uh, in West Hollywood, um, I had a place there before and he tells me and I start, I just started crying. I mean, there, nothing can prepare you for it. Now it's like I book a lead and I'm like, oh, okay, okay, cool. Let's do it. Let's get to work. <laughs> but, but wow, there, there's something I, I wasn't, I wasn't born into this. Nobody prepared me for this. My family, they're fantastic and they, you know, but they're doctors, they're medical, they're more into uh, for a career path that's very different. So they didn't, they did their best to kind of be like, you know, you're going to be great. We're proud of you no matter what, but that sense of self and deserving, nothing can prepare you for going on a journey by yourself in a skill set and a craft that you're, you're blind to. And then when you start getting successes, Wow, they hit hard. They hit really hard, beautifully so, but they hit hard. Was there a single memory or instance in your time that you're on Restless that sticks with you more than anything else? I mean, 
that first time, absolutely. Because the painful ones we have a tendency to remember. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <Till the question. laughs> but, um, but what's fun is that because it was a non-contracted recurring role, meaning they would just casually call every three to six months and say, we want you for several episodes. I remember that next call and my agent, and by the way, I still have that, that email, my agent printed out and framed. And so he has a copy of it and I have a copy of it. And, um, but that next booking, yeah, the next booking where they were like, they want you back. And I was like, really? And they want to do a, an article and in an in interview. And I was like, what, really? Like, I, I, I don't belong here. The imposter syndrome that I don't, why, why? Why would they want me back? What are you talking about? <laughs> and that's when they go, it's like, hold on, hold on. I, I'm going to grab a mirror and we're going to hold it right here. Look at this handsome guy. I mean, he clearly knows what he's doing. Throw it away and get seven years bad luck. No, uh, but I... I do have to tell you though, and and not to do a woe is me because I know it's so uh, stupid and all that kind of stuff, but trying to get into the industry because looks obviously play an interesting part. Not a matter of like good looking or bad looking or anything like that, but even if you're a character going out, like getting into character acting, you have to, it's a specific kind of look, mm -hmm. you know, for bad guys, for good guys. Like I don't play the the guy that's been through a fire accident. I'm the guy, you know, if I play a bad guy on Lifetime or something like that, it's because I'm the guy that you fall in love with and you want to trust, but I have like girls in my basement kind of thing. Right. And it's so when I was trying to get in, the feedback that my agent and I kept getting were it's too good looking. Can't do we like we can't bring him in theatrically because he's going to outshine the lead that we actually have for this movie or he's going to compete with him or he's going to make him feel insecure. And so like I couldn't even get in the room because they were like, oh, he's too good looking or it's that or it's that or this. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I will get prosthetics. I will smash my face against the wall. I will eat fast food for the next six months. I don't care. Like, give me a chance. Right. And of course, nobody would do it or anything. And I'm, I, you have to do other tactics other than self-mutilation. But <laughs> yeah, that's a little um, permanent. Yeah, yeah. You're like, hi, I'd like reverse cosmetic surgery. Can you do that? I just want to like, can we create a swollen lip and an asymmetrical face, please? <laughs> to which I don't have any of that. But but all joking aside, it's been an interesting journey. <laughs> Yeah, the, the I, 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 my favorite part is you are a perfect example that I talked about having worn so many hats before you've kind of in the position that you are now. Those are the stories that are really interesting, and a lot of a lot of actors share that kind of breadth of life right. experience before the, they get to where they are at this point. Now that kind of leads to my next question because again, I've mentioned that I'm more of a consumer of pop culture than a creator of pop culture. Um, and so I try and re I, I more relate to the people that are going to be the ones watching the films, the television shows. So we see the finished product. We see what is being uh, given to us as, hey, this is this is the thing. In the process of making the thing, what is something that that you would never have expected before you got into this industry that was a part of creating these stories that is like a rudimentary thing that you have to do every time. Oh, a rud that's something that's rudimentary that I have to do every time. Well, I mean, it's, maybe rudimentary is the wrong word, but it's something that's always required, something that we don't see as part of the creation process. That's a really interesting question. I thought it was going to go a totally different direction. Um, here's one of my favorite metaphors, <clears throat> and hopefully it leads into this beautifully. Uh, but there, there was this meme um, that was out for a while, I think years ago, and it basically it's a uh, it says, "Hi, I'm a photographer, and it's what my friends think I do, and it's photographing this model on the beach, right? And it's there's another picture next to it, and it says what my family thinks I do." And it's photographing like kids and a family. And then it says what I'm what I actually do as a photographer. And you're sitting there and it's a picture of a, a person sitting there editing. <laughs> and something that's always kind of stuck with me. I love being on set. Nothing, nothing replaces being on set 
in the in the energy in the magic creating and making things with you know like-minded people who all want a, a you know a great product hopefully they want the movie to do well so they're all you know there by choice and putting in everything they can but i will say what no one really tells you about and what the classes don't tell you about is all the work that you have to do at home it's all the work that you have to do to prepare it's all the work that you have to do to nurture and maintain the relationships or develop the skills or take the risks for things that you don't know how to do but then also to balance your family life and your work life and for a lot of because i i all of a sudden went from wanting it so badly to then all of a sudden having a lot of movie offers and things coming at me very fast I had a lot of people saying like you're working too hard like 10 hour 12 hour days like what and i'm like that's just on set. That's just on set. I go home and then I work for another two to three hours. And that's breaking down. If I have an eight to 15 page day, the next day, I, this isn't, my day doesn't stop there. And they're like, well, when's, what's the, you have to balance your life. You have to do this. You have to do that. And I'm like, I want this more. I want to balance my life while I'm doing challenging things. I don't want to reduce the challenges so that I can have a simple life in the name of balance. I'm not interested in doing something like that. So every time I get a role, I am constantly reinvesting in myself and that whether that's like I did an 18th century, uh, 18th century period, uh, Western horror movie last year. And you know, it's out of pocket. I'm, I'm spending the money to, to go get like gun handling classes and to buy the laser bullets and stuff so I can learn how to shoot from the hip and do certain things. And, you know, I, I know so many other actors when I talk to them and they're like, well, I'm not going to put up the money for that. I'm not going to try that. I'm not going to go shopping for this. Like I was on Showtime's Black Monday. Mm -hmm. I went out to the pier and re like recorded my audition before the audition came out and did the most ridiculous thing. I'm sure at some point it may get leaked onto you, but it's the most ridiculous, like body lathered in oil, like the most ridiculous, because it said there, it was like, you know, this is, this is showtime. It's, it's a ridiculous over the top parody eighties um, with like Regina Hall and Paul Shear and like all this stuff. And uh, yeah, anyway, we can move on from that. But the whole point is I went out, did it myself and when we're watching interviews and things like that, we hear from some of the people that have made it like go out, take risks, make it your own, take charge, don't wait, don't ask for permission, just do it. And we never really know what that means. But I can tell you on the come up of this journey so far, I talk to a lot of actors and I hear excuses left and right, or I, I can hear it within a sentence or two. Well, I, I mean, can you believe they wanted they wanted me to like fly in last minute to go do this, or they wanted me to buy my plane ticket. I can't tell you how many plane tickets I've purchased <laughs> to make it work mm -hmm. or to stay an extra night in a hotel to make it work because I was building. Now I don't have to do it, but I cut my teeth and I was willing to. And that's stuff nobody really, really tells you what it's gonna require of you to show up, but showing up is showing up period, and that's it. You know, to create greatness, you have to have that foundation of effort. Without that, there's nothing. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So now you're in a position where, like you are saying, you feel comfortable. It, it's good. But inevitably, we're all a mark for something. Yeah. You know, I, 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 in my mind, I always feel like one of my problems that I would have if I got into the industry is I would become starstruck. For <laughs> It's like, you know, I love love the work that uh, that everyone has put together and it's just immediately in my mind but obviously you have to be you know, it's just kind of right there have you ever been starstruck in the process of the creation of something yeah i uh, um i worked with vivica a fox and i gotta tell you like she was a childhood crush when i was younger I yep. mean, come on, come on. How can it not be? Oh, and I was like, oh, this is cool. I'm an adult. Like I'm, I'm going to like, I've, I've now, I got a couple movies under my belt. Like this is going to be so 
so easy, <laughs> so fine. And I'd already shot a week of the movie too. So I'm like, yeah, I already know everyone. Like, this is my playground. And but the, man, I got to tell you, she, she, <laughs> she walked in. I, we started doing our scene and I, words were not falling out of my face in the right order. I couldn't, I don't know what happened, but it, <laughs> there was, there was a part of me that just shut down and, um, and you know, we, we obviously had fun and, and we got through it and everything and it was great, but uh, but that was something where I've been able to hold my cool with a lot like Franco and and um, and just have a, you know, great time with a lot of people. But for some reason, my God, my my inner my inner child was was very, was very, very starstruck. I know, I wish facts. I, I'm really happy to be working with you right now. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I don't know if if I were in your position, I might have had one of those moments when you're on uh, the plus one. For me, it probably would have been uh, Cedric the Entertainer. Oh, but he was just he was so much. I think there's different like that starstruck. Like I was so in awe because he's phenomenal. Everything about what he did, and uh, you know, following all of everything from the comedy, from the movies. I mean, just he he is a legend. And so, but for, yeah, I will say for some reason, I was just, I was able to like do my bow and be cool and like go into scenes with him and it wasn't a problem and interact, talk with him like a normal human being. But yeah, Vivica, I, uh, that, yeah. yeah, no, that was, that was no coolness. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that, that would have been a different, that would have been a different level of difficulty. It's like it for the, you know, for me, it would have been, it would have, probably would have been, um, maybe Alyssa Milano, oh, something yeah. like that, that, yeah. that would have been, that would have been my side. But, um, so let me ask you this. It's, it's always good. You know, you see these, these individuals in the industry, you always want to work with people that are the masters of the craft that can really get back to, you can, you can kind of go back and forth and, um, and kind of get the most out of it. Who do you think that you've, you've, were there any instances that you did a scene with somebody and you go, man, I kind of got chills. This is, this is the thing that we just made here. Do you have anything like that? I don't have any specific stories, unfortunately, but I do have that moment happen. I will say that feeling quite a bit. Um, but I, one of the reasons why I feel like I don't clock it anymore is because editing, like I'm sure you've heard, you know, there are several different versions of a movie. There's right. the movie that's written, the movie that's acted, and the movie that's edited. And so I can't tell you how many times I lost myself in a scene and thought, that has O-S-C-A-R written all <laughs> over it, Oscar, baby. And then, you know, you finally see the movie and you're like, oh my God, they're not even using my coverage. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I've stopped clocking the scenes because so much of the film industry is technical and you know you you leave it on the table and you walk away and that's all that's all I can do but still so at least you get that feeling though right but yeah I mean that that feeling isn't so much a buzz but that feeling that I have is you know it's the the magical blackout it's be prepared enough um, to know the scene and what you're doing and say your lines, but then leave room for the magic. And if, you know, I'm saying blackout, it's obviously not a blackout. You have to be aware and observant, but it's releasing and surrendering enough to the scene to allow your subconscious to take over and kind of like dive in mm -hmm. to something unconsciously. Well, and you also can, I would expect you would develop a certain amount of not just familiarity, but kind of a shorthand when you work with certain people on multiple occasions, like you've oh, yeah. worked with Michelle Hurd a couple of times. And yeah. oh, I and, love Michelle. Yeah, it just, it just seems like that would be one of those instances. like, yeah, the, of course they go together. You know, you just see them together and they work and let's put them together again. Yeah, she's she's fantastic. And I, I'm fortunate enough that a lot of the work, the reason I've been able to work is because of repeat people. So whether that is, you know, Michelle, um, I've, I've worked a lot with like Brianna and, 
um, and Ansley and, and for female co-stars within these rom-coms and, and then even, you know, the directors like Lindsay Hartley and Dylan Vox and, um, and Jose and, and even DPs like, jo like these are such wonderful, close, respected and loved and cherished friends of mine at this point, because we, you know, we have that and Brittany Underwood, who she and I had the last Christmas movie. We had a Christmas movie last year and she's also directed me in several, like, there is an effortless oh, there's just a pressure released when you know and trust your scene partner they're going to show up they're dependable you know kind of the range of what they're going to give you within a rom-com world or something like that so you already know exactly what you're saying um, like you already know you know what the game is going to be like you it's like hey you want to go play you know a game of volleyball or something you're like yeah sure i know you're good let's rock and roll let's have fun i'm not sussing you out anymore i'm not trying to like you know figure out if you're going to show up or if i have to like catch the ball or protect you or watch your back it's like i know you're going to bring it let's just have fun and you get to play on a different kind of level with that that's got to be pretty excellent and not just that, but in instances where you get to come back to the same character. Now, and I'm under the impression that you have played a, a certain prince on more than one occasion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the uh, the Royal Christmas specifically, the one that just came out uh, December yes. 23rd on American Family. Uh, yes. that, that is part of a series, correct? Uh, technically, no. No? Oh. I, I apologize. I I was looking at it and I I, I was it's like, boy, but he's Prince in this and he's Prince in that. That looks like that's the same outfit. Is that the same? That's got to be the same Prince. I couldn't tell you exactly why all of this is happening, but it seems to be happening on repeat. <laughs> these are <laughs> these are different Christmas Prince movies, hmm. and when when you watch them i try to make them slightly different because even Brittany and i she the first christmas movie that she and i did together i was it was the prince and pauper christmas and i played two people um, oh it was amazing it was phenomenal and then they loved our chemistry so much and everything and how how well we worked together they were like let's do the one that was just released a royal christmas holiday um and even though we're the same people and people were have when it came out, people were like, wait, is this a continue? Wait, no, but that's your different name. You're from a different place. It's a, it's an entirely different thing, but you know, the same kind of situation she's playing. She's not an agent. She's a TV news anchor now, right? It's, it, it's just interesting. I, I don't know. All I can tell you is that this access to streaming is really leveling out the access to TV movies because you'll see a TV movie right next to Batman right. when you're scrolling and it's wild it, or like, in, like, it's just, it's absolutely wild. Um, what's put together. And I mean, that's not necessarily an accurate thing, but I just said, like you wouldn't see a TV movie now, but the point is streaming is, has made everything accessible versus just only on cable or only on a certain channel or a network. Um, this is, this has changed so much, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to see what happens this year. And if there's going to be any Prince, I've heard that there might be another Prince movie in the works. I, I hope so. Because if, if we could do a third Prince film, here's, here's, here's my pitch. This also completely unrelated to, to the other two films, but very, very similar. And then you can make a fourth and final film where it's like the whole multiverse is everywhere nowadays. And the, the same person across each of these individual films. And you all come together to figure out, it's like, oh, we we were actually supposed to be with this other princess. And you just kind of do this kind of <laughs> back and forth. Well, I feel like there's going to be that Spider-Man moment where it's going to be like, you, you, <laughs> you, Prince Jonathan? No, Prince Eric. Prince what? Prince what? Oh. <laughs> no i was prince last christmas well but i was the royal prince yes but i was this prince <laughs> i mean so, that would be that'd be amazing but the great thing about these the tv films is uh, tell me if you if you agree or if you or if you disagree you're kind of allowed to take chances that you don't get to see in a lot of the blockbuster films so because you're going to expect certain beats out of whatever film you go see. And if I'm seeing an action film in the cinema, 
I know basically how this is going to go within a certain realm of probability. But right. when I watch a TV film, well, you get to kind of play with, I mean, there's still certain expectations, but you get to play with it a little bit. I'll say yes and no. Here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing about it. On a bigger production, you might spend all day on two or three pages, one scene, and you get to rehearse it, dial it in, shoot it, do a hundred takes if you want, or if the director wants or whatever. You have the opportunity to polish certain things. What I will say is my guerrilla style <laughs> of getting into the industry and then accepting, because people have told me, why, why do I keep doing all all of these movies and even though like i'm i'm turning i'm still turning down projects and still working this much because there is there is that much available and because of the relationships and you know this is that's a marketing class all on its own like diving into all that all that but what i will say and none of that's to like brag or boast or anything it's it's to say these these movies are probably some of the best training because as i said what would i do for free these are this is what I love doing. And to make a movie, an entire movie in something like 13 to 17 days, unfortunately, unfortunately, doesn't give you a lot of time to, to play because you still have to be within the Hallmark world. You still have to be within, you know, right. a certain playground is what I like to call it. And, but, but what it does do is, it means you're getting one to three takes for everything you do, you know, as a general rule of thumb, which to me reminds me of Young and the Restless. You got one or two takes and that was it. So this is that version on uh, for, for streaming and for indie filmmaking and stuff. And so I now have this in, uh, remarkable and, and I'm so proud of I'm so proud of all the work that I've done, even though I like there are a lot of things that I can see and I'm like, oh, I was fighting with, you know, I was in a disagreement with my ex at the time here, or my mom was going through something on this day and I can see it in my face and I remember what was happening in my life. Um, so the skills are remarkable. There's, there's no, there's no showing up when you want to, or there isn't that kind of room for that that ego of a you know of a movie or a movie star or a lead or anything like that um where as i've heard you know nightmare ideas about people on bigger productions mm. and no 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 i'm getting a, this is i'm getting a little off topic and stuff like that oh, <laughs> but it's you know it's just interesting it, yeah it, it's really, really interesting. And these movies have really helped me, I think, refine my craft and help me play in other movies because they're so much, so dense, so fast. And then I'm learning my lines on the plane over to the next movie. Um, like even my next two movies, I'm going to go to Ohio and then I'm going to fly from Ohio back to LA. I'll have one day and then I'm on a plane to Florida and then I'm going to film out there for a while. And wow. then I'm going to possibly stay in Florida or maybe go to Montana and then back to Florida. Like, and it's and I have to create a character on the spot and that kind of uh, development and craft creation is something that you can't you can't teach in a classroom. You can't teach this kind of stuff other than real life scenario on the job training. So I do love all that. Well, how about we we do this? Because you've got like you said, you've got so many projects that have been coming out and I want to get like one key takeaway, maybe your favorite thing about each of these kind of productions that you've been involved with so far. And we'll start each. with one. Do what? Each, each? Each of the productions? I don't know if I could do each. <laughs> well, well, a couple of them. Then we'll do a couple. Uh, so w what about Royal Christmas? What was your favorite part about making that film? Or what do you think is the, the standout thing about that film? So a Royal Christmas holiday, something that was really fun in it i will say based, your last question about taking risks because i've done the prince a couple times with this one i did take some bigger risks on the playground and i'm more animated <clears throat> so i move my eyebrows and i'm like my face and i am a disney character on steroids a little bit and it's 
it's fun. It's a, <laughs> when I watch my performance, I'm like, oh my God, this would have been great in like 1980. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. That's, that's kind of the one thing when I think back to that in terms of my performance, uh, other than that, the people working with Brittany and Fred, the director and writer and, and that team, because now, you know, that, that crew, when I go out there, they're family. So, okay. Well, what about Under the Influencer, which just came out December 12th? Yes. <clears throat> so, Under the Influencer was interesting because I, I wasn't part of the original cast. In, uh, the original cast. I actually met the director at Dances with Films when, because I did this, I did an indie movie called Bone Cold uh, five years ago, and we got international distribution, which is unheard of for an indie project that's like, hundred thousand dollars and we sold it and this was a you know really big thing um for that kind of a project for the director and it's the stephen king thriller kind of thing and so we were getting ready to do the u.s launch and uh dances like tribeca and dances were both interested in taking it and we oh. were one of the last finalists for tribeca um and uh they were they dropped their their acceptance from 11 to 10 of the films and so unfortunately uh, we didn't make it but that allowed us to go to dances and we go to dances and we premiered there and everything like that and it was great um and i met alex and we we watched under the influencer <clears throat> and it was amazing and it was great we had a really enjoyed it it's a really fun project and then I don't know, like three months or four months, five months later, and we talked and everything. And Alex calls me and he's like, you know what? There's something missing from, from my movie. He's like, I want to add this other element. I want to try to add in these scenes, even though they had already shot this like a year ago. And he goes, I want to add some stuff. Would you be, and I, he's like, I remember you, you were phenomenal. Um, it was a great email to get. And he's like, if you'd be down, I want to talk to you about this and, and and write this stuff for you. And so uh, he's now newer family member and, and just a fantastic creative. And so that whole process within itself, that story um, about how you can meet people and other creatives and work together. And you never know, you never know when a call is going to come in. That's crazy. Um, yeah, there's a lot of times, you know, like I said, being on the side, being on the side of the screen, you don't think about how much can happen after the fact. Yeah, that's that's nuts. Uh, and that film, by the way, just looks fantastic. Uh, it's really fun. It's and, it's really fun. Anytime you can get, uh, anytime you can get that kind of uh, intensity in in a in that, it's just uh, that that hits me every single time. Yeah. Um, all right, one more. I got one more to ask you about. And this right. one just came out December 30th. That's The Secret Love Triangle. What yeah. was your favorite part on that project? <laughs> um, that's a great question. My favorite part on that. When, I mean, that was probably uh, beyond the cookie cutter answers of familiarity and friends and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Like, oh, something juicy, uh, you know, for the show. Let's see. Um, Everybody was a robot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the whole film is AI. <laughs> so, Regenerated. No, yeah. I'm the only real person in it. I was just interacting with tennis balls and green screen, like green sheets. On, you know, it was great. Um, no, I, I will say that the houses were phenomenal. And I don't want to discredit that. I don't, uh, again, I don't want to discredit because the crew's phenomenal. Like, I love this production. Good Form is amazing. Um, and Kyla's great. And like the, uh, Brianna and I have worked together multiple times. So there were so many so many elements to this. And that was one of the reasons why I, I did it. Um, but yeah, the houses and locations, one of the coolest things about doing some of these movies is getting to see these new places. And it's, it, it's just exhilarating when you're doing a scene and you're getting to explore new places in, in Los Angeles. And, um, and we had so I mean, so many of the scenes from like jailhouse interrogation rooms and, uh, 
I don't know what my favorite part was. It was, it was, it was just fun. It was cool. And everybody brought it and the movie's fun. Something like that. There is no better reason to go see a film. If, if you hear from the people that make it, that it was just, Hey, this was just the best to make because then that translates. It comes yeah. through when you watch it. Yeah. And you know, I know when we were filming, we would literally like step outside of the house and just like stare. Literally just stare off, you know, into this Topanga Canyon play for a couple of the different houses. And we were just like, God, look at this place. This is amazing. So I'm not trying to downplay it. Like, oh yeah, there was nothing special. The locations. Yeah, that was great. Here's an answer. <laughs> no, no, no. Like it was, it was beautiful. And we'd, wa we'd watch the sunsets and um, nobody wanted to leave. Like it was great. It was beautiful. Well, you, you talk to any any real any real screenwriter, any writer. Location is a character. And oh yeah, super yeah. important. Um, all right, so we're coming to a close. I had this whole section that I was going to ask about the strike, but I think I'm going to throw that because I got a couple other questions I want to, yeah. I want to go instead. Um, you know, and these seem like silly things, but the whole point of our show is, uh, as, as anyone that's listened to us, of course, bringing people together, enjoying things talking about the things that make our lives just a little bit better every day. And so we like to talk about the things that bring us together that may be uh, silly and slightly uh, adjacent to the subject. But so what I want to ask you, maybe the most important question I'm going to ask you is, are you a pizza guy? And if yes. you are, what style of pizza is your style of pizza? Oh, this is a dangerous question. <clears throat> um, considering I cooked in italy for a while i i oh, oh. <laughs> Why? as soon as you said that's like oh this is gonna be fun because <sighs> also like i cooked in for this italian company which is cipriani they have new york so i mean like new york and chicago deep like oh i you give me a good pizza or even just like freshly made there's a place here called sinful pizza and giovanni and i have become really good friends because he's italian and like I brought some friends over there um, a couple of weeks ago and he made like just out of the oven, fresh Italian pizza and like, but that was a thin crust, but there are places in Santa Barbara that have like three inch thick crust and like, oh, that's not a fair question. <laughs> is there a next? Well, I, like, there's I refuse no to wrong answer. answer. <laughs> <laughs> there is no wrong answer. It's, it's all good. At least I've, even, even back to the days, I don't know if you ever had the joy of being in a, cafeteria in a public school where they would serve you that rectangle and call it pizza even that was good but yeah the pizza that at some point became a vegetable sure yeah <laughs> oh all right now we were talking a little bit before we started into into the recording about this uh, apparently we're both fans of music and music yes. is an inspiration it's something that drives and that sticks with us uh, what type of uh, a music person are you? What type of music speaks to you? Uh, speaks to me. <clears throat> I would say anything that is really passionate and anything that is heartfelt, because you can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And I will say that that leans into, um, oh, man, I don't know. I know these are like semi cop out answers, but I, I promise you they're not, which is why I like I grew up on the piano and got into guitar and, and like my thing when I was younger is I, I got my hands on Berkeley School of Music, the textbook, and started teaching myself music. It's it's funny. Actually, wow. while you're here, I'm gonna show you something. Ooh. So I went through and I was like, I am going to master music theory and I want to create a hit record in every single genre. Now so it, it, like I, I wanted, I grew up, my brother was introducing me to like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Billy Joel and Elton John and Led Zeppelin and the who, and you know, some of the brilliant uh, masters of, and BB King and like, you know, so we, I covered everything from like hard rock to classic rock to blues, um, to then going all the way back into, you know, Sinatra and then hitting the twenties and like all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I was cleaning some stuff out recently and I found this. 
Oh, uh, now this, awesome. this is me as a kid breaking down how and why minor is minor. <laughs> That's like, cool. I am mapping out what one sharp, two flats, four flats, six sharp, six flat, like what is an, what is an A minor? What are the, what's the scale? Like all of this kind of stuff. And it's, when I say I have a deep appreciation of music, I, I feel like it's such a, such a cop out for anyone to just be like, oh, I only like heavy metal. It's like, no, dude, that, that you're limiting yourself to what music really is. It, it's not just a specific genre. It, it is a style of expression and communicating. And the only way that we become uh, better musicians is to release our judgment about what's good and bad and to accept all forms of music and the scales that bring us, you know, to them or make us feel something and, and touch humanity on its deepest level. Um, and that's from chord progressions and, and uh, to even the lyrics and the melodies that go around them. So I, I like, I, I love, 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 love music in all forms. It just has to be real and it has to be authentic and it has to come from a place from the performer um, to send chills up my spine. I'll tell you what, uh, I have two sons and maybe my favorite thing in, in, in recent memory is, you know, I, I tried to raise them on a variety of different styles of music. And, you know, you, when you're younger, you know, you, you kind of go, it's like, oh, that I like everything. Or even if you say you like everything, it's like, except for that one thing, that one thing is awful or, or whatever. <laughs> and I've been, I've been turned around more recently. It's like, I, I can't, I can't do bluegrass. Why would I do bluegrass? And then my cousin introduces me to Billy Strange. It's like, okay, that's why I would do bluegrass because he's amazing. Uh, but my sons are starting to introduce me uh, to music that I'm not familiar with. And it's just it's like, hey, Dad, there's this band called Polyphia. Have you ever heard them? It's like, no, I haven't. Play them for me. What style of music are they? It's like, well, <laughs> it's like, all right. Well, how about progressive metal mixed with jazz? Okay, we'll do that. And right awesome well, just I, yeah it's phenomenal and everything has changed like i remember you know just to be cool I, when i was growing up i'd be like oh yeah i don't listen to country right because that was like right. the cool thing don't right. like country and so i was like okay yeah i don't like country and then my brother was like here are the eagles hotel california i'm like awesome i this is why i want to learn guitar and i'm playing it and stuff and i was like oh i hate country and he's like I don't think, do you know what country, like the Eagles are country. And I was like, no, they're not. The Eagles are the Eagles. They're the like alternative or something else. He's like, no, dude, the Eagles are country. Yep. And I'm like, no, <laughs> right? Like my whole world shattered because you just want to put it in a box. Right. And, and unfortunately you can't, and yeah. fortunately you can't. And then we have so many cross genre things, even with movies and stuff like that. And it's like the, the real craftsman takes from all the different genres and makes it interesting or creates a new genre to fit into a genre. Uh, yeah. And to be limited by that um, for, for likes and dislikes is, is, is to limit our creativity and our soul. Uh, I don't, I don't do that. Why take joy away from yourself? I mean, yeah. just just unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, I've got one final parting question for you. Yes. Um, now, those of our listeners are already well aware. We tend to focus on uh, the intersection of movies and television with comic books more often than anything else. We're big comic book fans. Are you a comic book fan at all? Uh, I used to be when I was younger, yes. It was, it was, it was okay. a while ago. All right. So let's say... Uh, you are in, uh, I don't know, you're in New York, you're about to go get a slice of pizza. You stop at a cafe, you sit down and it's one of those, you know, newly made cafes that's supposed to seem like it's, uh, it's, you know, upper scale. So instead of the normal lights, they, they have these little lamps on each of the tables. You, oh, yes, that's a nice lamp. You touch it, you actually rub it. Genie pops out, but it's a, a very specialized genie he comes out. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm here to grant you wishes, but the only type of wish that I can uh, grant is related to the film industry. <laughs> okay. All right. And, uh, you know, considering that superhero films and comic book films are the big thing now, I'm going to be able to grant you the part of your choice. You can be any comic book character in a film. Who would you play? Oh. 
Oh man, these are these are good questions. <laughs> yeah. Um the okay. Ah, oh, no, no precursor. Nope. To well, I'm gonna say no precursor to anything that's happened before. The, my two favorites were Wolverine. Oh, look at that! The balloons behind me. Uh, oh, no, were, that's cool. Yeah. So Wolverine, but now would I want to re- replace Hugh? Um, no, Hugh is perfect. Paul. Yeah. But when I was growing up, um, I would have given anything to be either Wolverine or Gambit. Gambit's a very popular choice. Well, what's here's what's interesting. They've never made a good movie. No. Gambit has never been represented well. No. And I don't know if, uh, I, I mean, just, I don't know if he's ever really going to have a chance to have like a movie. I know they've tried. They've really tried to bring him in. And he was just such, he was just such a badass. Like, so cool. But my God, it, it just, well, that origins film was just doomed from the start, but uh... yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like a character and his wardrobe and all that kind of stuff. It, he was he was just awesome. But when I was collecting cards and stuff, oh, and some of the comic books, those are the two main comic books that I would get. He was great. Well, I've so, got one for you. If I were huh. casting and I say, okay, I got this guy, Jonathan Stoddard. He's got princely good looks, and. Uh, <laughs> And he, and he has at least a passing understanding of the comic book industry. And he, I, I would immediately, the person that I would cast, I don't know if you're familiar, the character's name is Vindicator. Uh, Vindicator. The team, team was Alpha Flight, Canadian superheroes. So, you know, familiar with Wolverine. In fact, he interacted with them several times in his early comic book career. Uh, started as a male character, a male character died, taken over by his wife, Heather Hudson. But... I think just for for your look that you've got and the type of character, they have not touched Alpha Flight at all. Man, Alpha and Flight. It's just kind of waiting to be done. It's this awesome team of really cool characters. And uh, I would just absolutely love to see that done. It's like, oh, you know, he kind of looks like he kind of looks like Vindicator. I think he could pull that off. He does look cool. I'm not familiar, and he's awesome. Yeah, very cool. So that's hey, what you should do. I will say, take hey. that. I'm looking him up right now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like, hey, hey, you get get somebody's ear, a producer, something. You know, we got to do something about this. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's, yeah, let's do it. That's right. All I'm right. In. Well, well, I want to thank you so much for taking your time to come on to our show today and and share well, a little you. bit of what it's like to be in the industry and to to be a part of these really interesting films and just thank you so much thank you i really appreciate your time and and just passion for all of this thank you and hopefully you know when you get that vindicator role you'll come back onto the show and say hey any any time and be like it started here (laughs) that's right all right Mm -hmm.